Welcome to 2007, a time in American anime culture where we all wore poorly crafted cat ears, glomps the shit out of our and yaoi paddled anyone in range straight into the shadow realm while screaming something about losing some game or whatever something you all lost by the way you're welcome it was a different time a dark time for anyone with personal boundaries or a sense of shame a time i thought i'd have forgotten about until this singular work of art ass blasted me back into it like i know i said time is a bastard and all but Damn. <laughs> okay, so today's book is one that I'm actually going to analyze and not simply point and laugh at for the lulls. It is the first installment of the Natan Fleet Show, Playing the Hero by K.E. Ireland, a little indie piece commissioned to me by Miss K.E. Ireland herself, who explicitly told me not to kiss ass. So I won't. But I do want to raise this bottle to Ireland for paying me to tear into what must be a very old work. Lord knows I don't have the guts to do that myself. I hope she gets her money's worth with this, and thanks immensely for being a patiently good sport. Cheers. Now, I struggled on how I wanted to discuss this piece because I figured this would just be a simplistic narrative with maybe a couple things I could prod at and call it a day. Your standard YA novel affair, if you will. But uh, no. No, this book has actual material to discuss. The text managed to rile me up and engage me, which is good in my opinion. I'd rather feel something, be it positive or negative, than nothing at all. Boring is worse than bad, because boring means I wasted my time. And I cannot say I wasted my time with this, nor can I say that it's truly awful. If anything, it's just severely unpolished. I can tell there are thoughts and ideas there. Effort went in to validate this main character's genius big brain, and there's very clear foreshadowing that's set up to layer payoffs, be it in this book or in future installments. But then the book gets hampered by loose plot threads, bizarre characterization choices, as well as unexplored themes that I'm not too sure were intentional to begin with. All the elements that make up the parts are so much more substantial than the narrative whole, which I'll have to divulge in first. And there is no way I can be brief with this one. Hell, I cannot be brief with this entire video. So let's f go. Part 1, a not at all brief story run through. This story begins at the tail end of a school play starring local 5 foot 7 inch space elf theater youth Fathion. Your boy has apparently ad libbed most of the performance, but that's okay. He is playing the super charismatic hero of the Empire, Natan Ganatet, or Deadbeat Shitbag Supreme, as I like to call him, the Deadbeat for short. Vathion gets that stand and O and meets some hotshot TV producer and then he like slips back the door with his mom before he can get swarmed by his many, many admirers. It's a precursor of what's to come. Natan's epic space adventures are also dramatized into an epic TV serial that's an utter hit with the masses. It doesn't mean anything right now, but don't forget its existence. In fact, let's put pins in these points of interest because I, I will hit them up later, I promise. Also, Vathion's got this peppy little alien lizard familiar. All the space elves obtain this kind of partnership with this particular species. Cool. Later that night, Vathion and his mom, Hasabi, space Skype call the deadbeat himself. Surprise! You see, he's Vathion's absent dad, and this relationship is a highly classified secret for safety reasons. That's been the excuse since before Vathion was born, and tonight, Hasabi's finally reached her boiling point. She's like, Damn it, we've been long distance for over 16 years. You need to actually meet your child. Space Skype ain't doing it anymore, fam. And the asshole's like, I mean, I'm like stationed at the border, and shit's pretty dangerous out here with these rebel empire scum. But, ugh, fine, okay, I guess. But, Oh golly gee damn, that happy reunion slash first time meeting cannot come to be as the deadbeat is mysteriously murderfied. Well, shit. 
So, Vestad's second in command, space elf Wallace Shawn, space Skype's Fathion to read off the will, where Daddy Deadbeat left his fam all the usual financial goods. He also bequeathed his entire private Blackwater Space Force and the accompanying title of Admiral to his 16-year-old child, and almost no one bats a single eye at this. Yeah, this is the kind of world we're going to be living in for the next 69 years. Luckily, Fathion's initially like, I can't possibly be an admiral to an entire private military space fleet. That's pretty whack. But his mom smacks his ass like, get it together, son. Mama didn't raise no pussy. Now you're going to go risk your life and command an entire fleet all by yourself, mister. Also, don't forget to pack your special custom Game Boy. Alley-oop. Fathion's all, well, I guess I got to go now that my mom told me so. Sad. Before mom ships the child off to lead military space camp, we meet childhood best friend, who is the most anime girl to ever anime, as well as Vathion's paternal grandparents. They don't really matter much at the moment. Just know childhood bestie suffocates her titties with her tight tops and she aims to get Vathion horny, to which she'll call him out on it for the lulls. They certainly have a relationship. Put a pin in it. Anyway. Mom makes certain that Vathion's got his special Game Boy and then drops him off at the space station. She has her final moments with him, put a pin in that, and pieces off to the Emperor's Witness Protection Program. Vathion also has a way too random encounter with this seemingly random ass alien guy, but they're just like a linguistic teacher buddy from Vathion's old part time waiter cafe job. All right. So Vathion boards the main ship, but suddenly the deadbeat's alien lizard familiar Pema yeets itself into Vathion. This severs the already existing bond, which in turn kills his peppy little lizard familiar. A traumatic moment that incapacitates Vathion for what's gotta be like some whole minutes. Maybe. Space elf Wallace Shawn, Gatus, that second in command from earlier, drags Vathion's body to a conference room for an emergency officer's meeting. He's all, okay, so. Since our new boss is a literal child, I will be taking the reins in his place. Vathion, you don't need to be here. Vathion then snaps the f out of his mental invasion long enough to argue with Gatas over the legitimacy of this 16-year-old's newfound authorita over them. Because, you see, Vathion had absolutely no choice but to become Admiral. There was no out for him. Said 16-year-old continuously doubles down and is even the one to yoink that dub. It's pretty rad. So rad that I face palmed only a little bit. That's a f***ing lie. I slapped my forehead silly. We're also periodically subjected to the Deadbeat's first-person POV autobiography. He's spectacular and smart and knows best and smashes all the babes all the time. But at some point, he got tired of the routine and became a belligerent drunk. Then he met Hasabi. Well, more like she was presented to him. And they've been together ever since. Emotionally, I mean. Physically, it was for only about three weeks. And I don't mean like three straight weeks of nonstop sex. I would have a begrudging respect for that. No, I mean, like, maybe a few days that consist of only the lewdest of hand-holding. And then he'll f*** off and leave her on the hook for so many actual months. Then he'll swing right back and pick up where they left off for a day or three. Eventually, they agree to a long-distance marriage and a baby. He gets to go off and live his dream in space while Hasabi gets to cherish her precious memento. And also, there's some, like, scent-based mating bond system that exists in this lore. Put pins in that entire what the fuckery. All in all, the autobiography sections are definitely the best parts of the book. 10 out of 10, for sure. Never prayed for the Grim Reaper to Kool-Aid man into my house and yeet my soul to paradise. Anywho. In attempt to bait out the Deadbeat's possible murderer, Vathion lies to the rest of the fleet about said Deadbeat's whereabouts. He's all, don't worry y'all, Pops just decided to randomly peace out to Space Cancun with Mom, you know, in the middle of our galactic war with these Empire Rebel scum. Don't worry about it though, I'm just a substitute admiral, everything Space Gucci. And everyone who doesn't already know the truth more or less buys into the lie. 
Bathion also spreads false deadbeat rumors to different publications. Also, the public doesn't panic over the loss of their idol. And I'm not exaggerating there. The civilians of this mighty empire are all a bunch of squealing female cardboard cutouts who share a single brain cell. He also uses the knowledge he's accumulated from his many years of being a pro gamer on his special Game Boy to coax information out of informants. The special Game Boy was created single-handedly by the Deadbeat. It turns out to be an 8-bit sandbox simulation game that has a near one-to-one -one correlation to real life. Put a pin in that. Bathion orders the crew to dock at a port station or whatever, and he goes out to charm the press and other fanatical brainlets, all of whom are women, which is something that the book will consistently note. Some hours later, I think, Bathion's vibing on the ship, possibly venting his feels to the worst supportive lizard familiar ever. Pema pretty much believes depression doesn't exist and to walk it off, buddy. Pema also all too suddenly gets a case of the zoomies and bolts off. I get the impression it's implied that Pema just decides to spontaneously lure Vathion someplace. Nevertheless, Vathion's all like, what the hell, and gives chase. And he just so happens to stumble upon a secret officer's meeting concerning what they want to do with their new child boss. Baby Boss Boy is not fond of this insubordination, the utter nerve. How dare these experienced Spellvish Space Force crewmates, who have definitely stared death in the face on multiple occasions, doubt the capabilities of this random 16-year-old child who holds dominion over them. The sheer audacity. These veteran adults just need to put their blind trust in this inexperienced fetus, okay? Their previous totally infallible admiral made no mistake in passing on this immense responsibility to his child and what can only be an act of nepotism. You guys have to understand that Vathion had his special Game Boy to train with. The crew just needs to see him apply his pro gamer skills to IRL battles. He'll unleash only the most hack sort of ponage. God, I feel dirty just saying all that. Ugh. Bathion scolds the utter shit out of these adults, and they all just f***ing take it. Awesome. He also orders them to go to this other port station place that sits in dangerous territory for reasons he chooses not to share because he can't trust these guys, right after he ordered them to trust him. Fantastic. I guess some more hours pass and they dock at the dangerous station and Vathion gets a space Skype alert that some of his crew were killed in some space bar fight? What? And who'd usually care about that except one or two of those victims also moonlit as spies that reported to the other admirals and the emperor. Also, quick note, after Natan's death, Gatus immediately fired personnel that seemed pretty sus to him and among those fired were more spies. Nobody trusts nobody on this military fleet or whatever. Anyway, Vathion space skypes with the Emperor and apologizes for the loss of his narcs. The Emperor is like, oh, whatever, it's all good. Just like, go to this other port station or whatever and get some more. Also, I guess we're like besties now? And Vathion's like, cool. But he has another little panic attack meltdown over possibly messing up in front of the Emperor about the bar fight event that he had no control over. And then he's like, let's watch some news reports. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. He watches himself be interviewed by a female reporter while being surrounded by captivated female civilians. Fantastic. Then, Vathion utilizes some loophole measures through his special Game Boy to bypass the ship's system logs so he can sift through security footage of the deadbeat in space incognito mode. The scene goes places, and I'm gonna put a pin in that for later as well. More time passes, and Vathion has a better meeting with the other fleet captains. He brings the deadbeat's urn, and they discuss the ongoing possible murder investigation. Later, en route to that dangerous spaceport to pick up the new narcs, the fleet stumbles upon some rebel scum and Vathion rolls initiative. He vanquishes the traitors in a strategic chess match so one-sided that Lelouch Lamperouge would be impressed. But I wasn't. Gatus fusses about, which is his default mode, unfortunately, and before they can move on, the fleet hoists themselves straight into encounter number two. Bathion utilizes a maneuver that was used in an old episode of the fleet's TV show, and it obliterates the rebel ships. I guess the Rebellion group is severely lacking in intelligence officials who could see this move coming, considering how popular the TV show is all around the Empire. But alas, 
They arrive at this new dangerous spaceport after they rescue a stranded merchant family and obtain important coordinate data from them. But they cannot disembark yet, as there's a little fleet of alien scavengers blocking the docks. Yo, hey, do you remember that random-ass encounter Vathion had with that random-ass linguistics teacher buddy all those minutes ago? Well, it turns out that said aliens got pulled with this group of dock blockers, so Vathion flexes his linguistic skills and negotiates access to the docks. Once again, nepotism comes in clutch, and the social link is formed! Yay! Vathion dons his spectacular mask for the fangirls waiting for him. Would have been in that. It is an act that has curdled so bad you could make the foulest of cheese from it. Also, childhood best friend makes a triumphant return after being absent for about half the book. She continues to ham it up as the animeist of anime girls who knows everything there is to know about Vathion. Oh, the multitude of stories she could and does recite at the drop of a hat. The two of them agree to meet up later that evening, as Vathion's gonna meet up with the Station Master and two Admiral colleagues. Admiral 1 is stern Silver Fox, and Admiral 2 is a temperamental not hot one. The four of them shoot the shit over sound systems of all things for a solid 90 minutes, and I'm not lying, it says that right here. It's just... What are the odds that these four random dudes of varying ages all happen to have the same niche interests? Okay. I mean, sound systems, that's a choice. So they eventually discuss some Space Navy related Pew Pew the Rebel Scum business. When Vathion leaves, the POV decides to just spontaneously switch to Silver Fox and the other adults who are all like, Wow, that child sure is clever. There's certainly more to him than meets the eye, to to to. The circle jerk lasts for only a couple of paragraphs. It's, it's almost as if it didn't need to happen in the first place. Bathion returns to his cabin to get his investigative vibe on. He takes data he obtained from the merchant family and his new alien dock blocking scavenger buddies and puts it into his special Game Boy, which somehow plays out accurate simulations of possible rebel fleet movement. Bathion's all like, whoa! He space skypes the Emperor about it and seeks permission to check it out. He also reports that he plans to fire Gatas for throwing off his groove one too many times and for being an all around big dumb whiny butt. Emphasis on the, the dumb and the whiny. The Emperor's like, Kebu, you do you, namaste. The Emperor's so f useless. <laughs> He's only hot and <laughs> so f useless. Vathion, <laughs> Vathion and childhood best friend go out on their date, and these two weirdos actually have decent chemistry with each other. But while the child boss is away, Gata slips in to take the captain seat for a joyride, and child boss is the exact opposite of pleased. Displeased, if you will. In fact, he grounds Gatus and sends him to his room without supper. That'll show him. Vathion dusts his hands off and orders the fleet to set course for that possible rebel hideout from the special Game Boy simulations. Sure enough, they encounter a large old Mama Jama rebel scum fleet and engage in big climatic space battle. Whole lot of pew pew pews and pow pow pow. <laughs> can't do that. I can't do sound effects, but there's a whole lot of that shit going on, as well as some actual loss. Vathion's fleet takes enough damage that his defeat seems imminent, and he's full on ready to ride or die, like embracing martyrdom full on. But then the alien scavenger buddies come in clutch and save the day. Ugh. Post battle aftermath, Vathion's sad because he learns that people die when they are killed. Nevertheless, he still puts on his big boy pants and is prepared to make the appropriate funeral arrangements. Childhood best friend is there to offer her ear and shoulder and lap an implied fade to black coochie in support. Vathion, possibly reinvigorated by the cooch, meets up with the Admiral Silver Fox and Admiral Not Hot One for like a big battle post mortem. Vathion flexes his super decoding skills as well as his over familiarity with the Emperor. Look, the book's almost over and it's determined to get as much Vathion dick stroking that it can muster and, and like. Come on, man, I'm tired. Just come already so I can go to bed. Vathion meets up with a bunch of fleet engineers concerning the necessary repairs. 
he shows them his own blueprint designs and they're like, oh my god, these are great, you're so talented! Then he space skypes some alien wolfmen, he IT poses the captain into submission which somehow earns child boss a bunch of ship parts for clearance prices. The alien wolfman captain, who was just out alpha'd by a space elf fetus, is impressed with his awesomitude. Yawn. Bathion is also invited to dinner on board the alien dock blocking scavenger fleet. They try to prank him, but Bathion figures such a prank would happen and comes prepared ahead of time. He boards their ship all triumphant, and that's the last we see of him. He just carries on as his usual self, and there continues to be an imbalance in the force. Yay. The book closes out with Pema on trial in front of all the fleet's other space lizard familiars, and they're all like, You done did diddly f***ed up, you lizard! And Pema's like, Can you be more specific? The lizard familiars drop some last minute plot points that's meant to tease the next installments. Points that include Vathion possibly being a special via some eugenics-esque shenanigans. The lizard familiars might have a more insidious relationship with their space elf partners than we're led to believe. And the series' major, or main antagonist, is a girl boss bad bitch who we've never seen and has only been name dropped a few times. She's also anti-eugenics and anti-alien lizard brain slugs. What? <laughs> Pema gets a slap on his itty bitty wrists and Lizard Court is adjourned. That's all, folks. The end. Okay, let's pick this baby apart. Part 2 The writing, its structure, and lack of flow. I am going to be blunt here. This book reads like an early draft. Sure, there are the occasional typos. What draft doesn't contain those? But it's the un godly sentence structure that has made this book a struggle to get through. The prose is littered with so much awkward phrasing. There's also an egregious use of participial phrases, as if that's the only way a sentence can be structured. There were times it even made me question if sentences were grammatically correct. I occasionally had to stop reading altogether and research grammar rules just to be sure I wasn't going insane. Good god, if anything I hate ing words so much more now. Adverbs don't pave the way to hell anymore, Stephen King. ing words lead the pack now. Ugh. I am ashamed how long it took me to make it through the book. I cannot count how often I stopped after reading a sentence and just sit there like, what is this? Or I'll read through a sentence as long as a paragraph that's stapled together with as many commas as one can muster and either one, do the one sentence one breath challenge, or two, consider how I restructure it to make sense. And I did that for over 320 pages. Very, very rarely was I able to just engage with a text as a reader and not a copy editor. I mean, by the end of the reading, my Kindle notes had more highlights than the average Karen. Some choice examples. Taking off the belt that held his baton, Bathion dropped it over the back of the couch on his way to the vid phone in the far corner of the room. Meanwhile, comma, Vestas, comma, feeling that the conversation was over, comma, leapt up to the ceiling, comma, caught it with his hands, comma, and pulled his feet up afterwards, comma, continuing his way towards the alien embassy on Lorena. He'd spent a good part of his life on Victory Station, comma, but never really took to space, comma. I, however, comma, really missed space, M dash. I'd gotten to be a real hot pilot by then, comma, and not having a ship nearly drove me crazy. Looking worried anyway, Bibble pulled his head back and the door closed. The battle plans lit on the screen on the opposite side of the room, and Vathion released Pema and got to his feet, comma, walking around the desk to read the script on the screen, comma, arms folded. Taking a breath, comma, Vathion swallowed, comma, closing his eyes, comma, trying to calm himself. He had gotten lucky with that first battle, and now they were slightly damaged and going into another battle before his adrenaline had cooled. So, comma, on the fourth day, comma, I called crew in and we headed out, comma, but only after I'd made sure Hasabi had enough money to live off until the baby was born, and after that, I'd be paying her expenses while she was stuck at home taking care of it, comma, and I'd be paying the bills on the house. It's... it's like Ireland held Ben Shapiro at gunpoint and stole his vast collection of commas. <sighs> 
And now, here are some one sentence, one breath favorites. <sighs> one idiot decided to argue with me and he ended up getting shot down because I let off those who decided they liked me better and we kicked butt and took names pulling through the battle without another loss and with the most engine kills on simulation record. Fathion smiled that charming smile again, and it felt plastic on his lips even as he continued. But never fear! Abruptly, he turned and left atop a nearby box that was painted black and red. Something- Oh damn it, I took a breath! No! Fuck. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fathion smiled that charming smile again, and it felt plastic on his lips even as he continued. But never fear! Abruptly, he turned and left atop a nearby box that was painted black and red, something that had likely been set up by fans when word got out which dock the Zarian would be at. I talked Ninisaki into retiring from the forces and taking over Green Wave. I just took a breath, goddammit! I'm so bad at this game. I talked N Ninisaki into retiring from the forces and taking over Green Wave. Fo practically jumped into my lap and begged me to let her have the seven, so I agreed and let my new captains pick their bridge crews since I'd filled out mine to my liking, except for a second in command. I think I really confused a lot of people because I'd been working on myself over the last few months, trying my hardest to stop cursing in public and have a no thank you come to me automatically instead of piss off, which offered something I don't want and that had gotten some strange reactions the first few times I'd said it. <sighs> like, jeez, man, periods are your friends. They exist to help you and help me to breathe. Because I like air. Another issue that had me stumble through the text was the lack of expository flow. There were some instances where like little tidbits of information or exposition would be arbitrarily dropped, and we won't understand the meaning of it until some unspecified time later, for no reason or greater purpose. For instance, Fathion and childhood best friend chatted about one of their teachers and referred to them with this she pronoun. Sure, it can be inferred then and there that this is a non-binary pronoun, and then it's like more or less confirmed a couple of literal chapters later. And that's that. <laughs> Didn't need to be confirmed over then. Done it right there. No. Another example, there are these two crewmates who are obviously sisters who happen to have orange hair. Granted, I'm a dum dumb. This should have been my first big hint. Pages later, we learn that there are these carrots, twin weapons that the sisters operate. Therefore, it's inferred that these two are known as the carrots. More pages later, we learn that they actually have orange hair and green eyes, and that's why they're the carrots. Like, wh why just do that? Just put it all together. It's fine. And it's, it's just... It's these little harmless things that really means nothing and I'm, I possibly am just nitpicking. It's just these little things add up and it's annoying. <laughs> like, it doesn't need to be like this. And I know meaningless suffering is fun. Get your kicks off for just making your readers suffer a little bit. That's fine. Ugh. But then there are times when I'm held in anticipation for much, much longer. See, underneath all that comma stapled writing, there'd be like semi-relevant info dangles that I'd miss as I hack and slash through the massive prose jungle. Case one, a bunch of characters are presented with this syllable in conjunction with their name. I had no idea what it initially meant and I documented my guesses as I progressed. Was it an honorific? A part of their given name or surname? I wrecked my brain over it for a good chunk of the book. And then, it's finally revealed to be the character's title rank, and I was like, hallelujah, that scratch has been itched, I may breathe again, until I can't breathe anymore for some arbitrary stupid reason that the text just fumbles around with, not important. Yet, then I wondered if I missed that initial drop, stopped reading again, and searched for it, and there it was, right there, buried in the jumble, and I just glazed right over it. Good job, me. I have eyes and I can read and comprehend. Nyeh. Case two is essentially the same thing. For an embarrassing amount of time, I was under some baffling misconception that I cannot explain. I am just that dumb that the Deadbeats autobiography was published to the public. So I ripped on his terrible storytelling every chance I had. Where was his space editor? 
What space publisher would release this low-effort schlock? These were coping mechanisms to keep myself going. I admit, I will take partial credit for being a total goob and not retaining these little info dangly drops amidst all the garble. But remember, the prose is littered with its jank ass phrasing. You can't expect my glazed over eyes to catch everything. Excuses, excuses, I know. <laughs> Though, I believe that top tier what the fuck immersion wrecking moments come from Vathion's security footage sleuthing. It is one of my favorite scenes. I have to talk about this shit. Okay, so. Bathion taps into his inner Bruce Wayne to investigate a possible conspiracy surrounding the Deadbeat's fatal case of compression. I swear, this is my favorite line in the entire book. And considering how there were all these other zany assassination attempts ripped straight from a Looney Tunes cartoon, <laughs> it is insane that the thing that got him was a giant crate just smushed into giblets. It is awesome. <laughs> and I'd find it all jarring as hell, but instead it just puts a big old doofy grin on my face. <laughs> anyway, Matthew pulls up current security footage as his starting point, and we get this. If he had not been sitting down, Matthew would have fallen over. He was given a view of the medical lab. The security was focused on a regeneration tank, which incubated a steadily growing adolescent who looked almost exactly as if Atheon had at that age. The doctor stepped into view and took a careful look at the readout and nodded to herself, then turned and headed off. Like, holy shit, what's this? Who is in the tank? Does Vathion have a secret twin? Is the deadbeat not actually dead and is secretly recovering? Whatever it is, it shocked Vathion quite a bit. So I'm perked up, let's see where this goes. Vathion's like, what the? Is that woman obsessed? And I'm like, with what? What's going on? Then he barely catches Pema, zooming right out of the room from his periphery, and he's like, Hey, what the hell? You know something, don't you? Get back here! And I'm like, okay, the tension is rising. Is Vathion gonna give chase again? Last time he did that, he stumbled across the secret officers meeting, so there's precedent for something happening from chasing after this needlessly cryptic ass lizard. Okay, let's see him go after Pema. But he doesn't do that. Bathion instead summons Kitty, the ship's AI, and then he's all like, Ship AI-chan, where's the little son bitch going? Oh, he's going to the rec room? Ugh, whatever, just let me know when he goes somewhere else. Um, okay. Tension kind of fallen now, cause why the rec room? What's going on there? It's no secret that the shitty little lizard knows things and chooses not to divulge them for reasons. But after that reveal in the med bay, it makes sense that Pema would run off there, or anything to keep that the focus of the scene. Instead, a rock was just chucked at my head, and I'm, I'm now confused. But whatever, this disruption is just a bump in the road. We can at least get back to the mysterious Vathion lookalike in the med bay. Except JK, because the next question is about Gatus's whereabouts and movements. Um, is that really important at the moment? Sure. I'm curious about anything Gatus might be scheming up, but is now the time? What's happening in the damn med bay? I never f***ing find out either, cause Kitty, donning a digital skimpy outfit, pouts and practically shoves her tig old digi bitties in my face all like, oh, alright sexy beast, Mwah. anything else you want, oh king of the bedroom? And I'm like, ma'am, this is a Wendy's. May I have my med bay order, please? The focus then shifts to old footage of senior deadbeat, and I'm John Travolta wondering what the hell just happened here. Thanks, I hate it. Who or what was in the med bay? Well, since the story puts off that answer, so shall I. Part three, the damn TV show and the OP special Game Boy. These two gimmicks the very backbone of this book. First, the show. It is introduced as early as page one, with the play being based on one of the adapted adventures. We also meet the producer shortly after. This show gave our ego-driven deadbeat and his fleet peak clout within the Empire. Eventually, when Vathion was born, Natan aimed to use the show to be the All Might to his son's Izuku as compensation for being unable to be physically present. Okay. So, you have this element introduced almost immediately. Fun pew-pew times with a renowned space hero, woo! 
And then we get this rather dismissive comment during one of the Deadbeat's autobiography sections. I admit, the idea went to my head, and that was when the Hanatan that we all know today was born. Wild catchphrases and all. It took a bit for my bridge crew to get used to it, but once they did, they started having a lot more fun during battles. Considering that we were killing people, it was a much needed levity. Oh, yeah, that's right. There's been a whole rebellion going on. Uh, so we got the adventures of N Natan's fleet that involved, you know, going around and actually killing pe- uh, uh, I mean, rebel scum. Can't humanize these guys. Some murder fun time adventures that's been adapted for the consumption of the precocious masses. Uh, so, like, what do you guys think comes from this? Do you think any of the bridge crew harbor resentment for their boss dragging them all into his massive ego trip without any of their consent? For having their life dramatized as mere entertainment? I mean, the fact that it's regarded as a much-needed levity tells me that some of these guys are harboring some form of PTSD, and they're using this kind of pomp and circumstance to cope with this now glorified warfare. Speaking of glorified warfare, how do the people regard the ongoing conflict? We see both Natan and Vathion get utterly fawned over by fangirls. The narrative, through Vathion surprisingly, acknowledges that they're the Empire's mascots. So then, is this rebellion even real to the civilians? They act as a collective of ravenous brainlets who stand the deadbeat and later deadbeat 2.0. Like, are they so enraptured over the commodification of the actual warfare going on around them that the reality of it doesn't feel all that threatening to them anymore? Unfortunately, I don't know. I never so much as get a hint of any kind of direction or consequence with it. Like, that quote said, everyone seems pretty f***ing fine with it. Fun times for the whole empire! Woo! Which is so f***ed up. And totally something worth exploring. But alas, we get nothing more than surface level poking. Not to mention, since the main star has been squished to giblets, the show's gone on hiatus and Vathion has the opportunity to bow out from it. However, he decides to sign his rights away for series 2. He says that he could only foresee difficulties if he didn't do this, but I fail to understand what those could be. Is he afraid of how the brainlit masses would cry or something? It's a frustrating decision because he once again steps further into the shadowy deadbeat shaped abyss when he doesn't have to. And, and yet it's even more frustrating because this is totally something that's very in line with his characterization. Some things I'm going to talk about later. So all I can do is grin and bear with it. Either way, the whole topic is essentially dropped altogether for the rest of the book. I mean, they got pre-production to do and all. <sighs> So, we have one unexplored concept. See, at first I thought the show could be cut and there'd be nothing really lost, but I take that back. The show makes sense for world development purposes, to show how f***ing messed up the whole empire is. Even plot-wise, Vathion can draw information from the show to help him, which he does during his second battle. And it's sure to be a source of mental turmoil for Vathion come series 2, cause that boy's due to be broken at some point. Next, we have an overdeveloped concept, the special Game Boy. For real, this game is so OP. It's led Vathion to make successful decisions left and right. He played the game for years and achieved 7th rank admiral on it, which is a qualifying factor for his new IRL position. And no, I'm not joking. Every bit of the Empire is recreated in 8-bit form so Vathion can learn how to handle their IRL counterparts. For example, when Vathion needed to coax some dirt from his informants, his experience with their 8-bit versions provided him with the appropriate solutions. Oh, according to the game, this one ex-pilot informant guy is a slush. Better bribe him with booze. Nailed it. This popular sex worker, oh, I mean whore, who is, of course, one of the many women who wants the hero's dick, TM, doesn't like being ignored and can be emotionally manipulated rather easily. Oh, these other admirals have set character traits, and this is the exact way to interact with them. God, I am such a pro gamer, lol. And it works in Vathion's favor every single time. Every character bends to his will because he's already familiar with how they behave. He essentially plays his new life on easy mode, and it's nothing short of boring as hell. Granted, the narrative makes a rather flimsy point to try and instill the life isn't a game lesson to Vathion, but he's pretty much like 
I don't know, fam. It hasn't really failed me yet, so... No one has the character depth to go beyond their perceived video game character stats, nor do they just straight up tell Vathion to f*** off. The special Game Boy is the largest crutch Vathion has in this book. Without it, he'd have to actually put forth serious thought and effort in his tasks. And even then, he'd run the risk of possibly failing. The Game Boy also acts as Vathion's own VPN, where he can covertly cycle through the ship's security files without leaving a trail in the logs, as well as accurately compute complex battle simulations that are drawn from sets of vague coordinate data. So, I mean, that's just two more things it can do. But at its core, the special Game Boy is a f***ing massive open-world RPG adventure game comprised of thousands upon thousands of battle simulation scenarios with perfect digital renditions of the fleet's crew, as well as the whole galactic empire's worth of NPCs and locales. The sheer scale of this game, from a development standpoint, is so astronomical, I just cannot even. Too OP. Please nerf. The Deadbeat single-handedly created this game for Vathion and the young emperor to be as a training device. How the ever-loving f*** did the Deadbeat ever have time to create this absolute behemoth all by himself? I guess relegating menial duties to the ship's mother hen and abandoning his family altogether freed up some time for him to flex his JavaScript and pixel art skills on space RPG maker XP. But even then, between murdering traitors scum and posturing for the masses, two time and energy consuming activities in their own right, like how? How did he do this? <laughs> I guess he really must be as smart as he claims to be to be able to multitask like that. I know, I know, I'm getting into pedantry right here with this. But I, I, I let, let me have this. <laughs> let me have this anal retention. <laughs> I, I don't. Okay, no, okay, no, stop. I, I gotta stop thinking about this asshole. <laughs> He's gonna drive me insane. Let's move on. I gotta talk about something else. Part four. The friend, the hen, and the mother. There are a plethora of named side characters with unique anime designs, but like I said, they all have the depth of a 90s after school special. These three are the ones I want to focus on though. Starting with childhood best friend. Her name's actually Mirith, but unfortunately, she is devoid of any other identity besides Bathion's childhood best friend. The narrative admits as much. This passage pretty much nails her entire character. She had been his best friend since he started school, very much a tomboy. She held a firm belief in justice and standing up for the weak. As a result, she had been his protector when he was little. By the time he started standing up for himself, she had hit puberty and had started hitting on him in obvious attempts to get in his pants. Fathion has always been the center of her orbit and she has no plans of ever leaving it. To her credit though, her scenes with Vathion are actually the most organic in the whole book. It is seriously one of the only times I'm fully immersed. Their relationship is so f***ing odd, I cannot look away. Like, the book wasn't kidding about her obvious attempts to get in his pants. She's pretty horny on main for ya boy, and she'll happily comment, I got ya horny, like any anime childhood best friend would. Hell, can you even call your bro your best friend if you can't tongue them while you lightly trill your hand up their thigh? I think not. Mirith also functions as Vathion's personal cook, therapist, and reminiscer of innocent childhood days, something she does frequently. To Vathion, to reporters, to waitresses, this girl's past and present revolves around this guy. It doesn't help that Vathion recommended a TV show producer to cast her as his best friend, i.e. have her play herself in his drama adaptation. So not only does she orbit around Vathion, she is also nothing without him. Yeah, that's certainly what you want in your heroine. Mm-hmm. Great. <sighs> From someone who can't exist without Vathion to someone who wants to shoot him out of an airlock, let's talk about Gatus. He'd easily be best boy if the book didn't take pot shots at him every twist and turn. Oh man, this poor guy. The book does Gatus' character so dirty. <laughs> take away the characteristic nerfing, and he's legit the only adult in the room with the balls to stand up to Vathion. Gatus was the only one to vocally oppose his new child boss's appointment for completely rational reasons. 
Hey guys, I have a real problem with our new child boss going off to have these secret rendezvous. He's really not doing much to instill our trust in him. You shouldn't jump from one battle to the next child boss. One of our ships is mildly damaged. But oh no. You know, he's got to say that shit being all like... Blah, 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 blah. He's a power hungry stick in the mud who just can't stop bitching and moaning about rules and protocol and you can't possibly trust those primitive lesser species rarely do i see a narrative bend over backwards to shit on a character this hard if you need to make him cartoonishly unlikable making him space elf ted cruz is an effective choice and if i wasn't rooting for this guy to keep persevering against the machinations of the story or if i was a child this character assassination would work like, the narrative hinges on you rooting for Vathion to prove his worth to everyone at the table, and it has to dumb down the antagonistic obstacle to make it work. Gatus is consistently described as having an awful personality and that nobody, and I mean nobody, likes the guy. Not even the Emperor. Vathion confides to the Emperor that he suspects Gatus to be a rebel sympathizer and recruiter, and the Emperor is like, Fine, you can you can fire him. Arrest him if you want, boo. I have unadulterated faith in your judgment, Admiral Child Boss. And Vathion's all, Nah, I, I can't do that. It wouldn't do over right with the crew if I suddenly replaced him. And I'm like, Are you sure? Because, like, the text tells me that no one would lose a second of sleep over his departure. Not to mention, when did you start caring about what your crew thinks, Mr. Just Trust My Decisions? Before Gatus met the deadbeat, he was an intelligent and ambitious pilot who got so horribly injured in battle he could no longer pilot again. The deadbeat pitied him enough to appoint him as second in command. I, I really want to think that there's more nuance to this, that Natan saw something deeper in him. But like many things here, we never find out what that thing could be. But you know, perhaps the trauma from his injury is why he's extra cautious on the state of the ships, or why he doesn't trust at least one of the other alien species. Or maybe he has become disillusioned with the state of the empire he serves, and really, who can blame him given the empire's sorry state? However, I could very well be grasping at straws, desperate to find something that may not even be there. I just don't know. Honestly, Gatus is the embodiment of the why you booing me, I'm right meme. Or, if any of you viewers follow my Handbook for Mortals series, he's Sophia. Therefore, he's gotta be my fave, even if the book really doesn't want him to be. And finally, there's Vathion's mom, Hasabi. She is similar to Mirith in that she is nothing outside of the men in her life. But let's start at the beginning with her. She was presented to a 36-year-old deadbeat at the ripe age of 19. Now, I don't have many issues with age gap romances in fiction. The way I see it, as and pretty much with, you know, narrative fiction in general, as long as the writer consciously knows what they're writing, then I'm game, you know? Dead dove, don't eat. Don't like, don't read. In this case, you've got an unrepentant man-child who strings along a young and raptured woman. And yes, you can absolutely attribute the gap here. Yet the narrative, via only the unreliable narrating deadbeat, tells us that everything's apparently fine. There's no incoming dependency complex that would surely have no ill effects at all. Which is lazy, because we all know this is yet another source of unexplored conflict. Anyway, she's presented before him because the deadbeat's been too much of a wild and belligerent drunk for his age, and he needs a waifu to settle down with. So his pals literally just go out and find a chick, some chick, any chick it seems, and present her to him as an offering. And it works. They're in hand holding hair sniff and bliss for a solid week, maybe a week and a half, before he's got a bounce. I didn't get back to the station for another year and a half. But there she was, waiting at the front of the crowd with a bottle of my favorite wine and some flowers. Oh. Oh, honey. Oh, this hurts. Oof. They have one PG-rated dinner date together, and he's gone again the next day. Six months later, he rolls on back up to her station and is disappointed when he doesn't find her there. One would consider that 
Mm, maybe those six months of pining over what if, Hasabi realized that she deserved better. So she packed her things and left, out to pursue bigger and better wonders. Space college? Backpacking in space Europe? The sky's the limit for our young adventurer! A strong, independent woman who don't need no man. Except no. She's actually waiting on his bed for him. She's like, Hey, I feel like the rebels are gonna ax you one day. And considering I happily waited on your hook for a total of two years, I want a part of you as souvenir of our time together. And the deadbeat's like, Coolio. Three days later, he catches a whiff of that Vathion bun baking in her oven. And he knew it was time to check out permanently. The good old come and run, if you will. But, you know, he had to go for her safety. Because he's famous and he can't put her at risk by association. Not only would he frequently be in dangerous territory, but if something happened to him, she'd be sure to follow as his mated bond or partially bonded. Okay, like, I, I guess now's a good time as any to address this. So, these space elves have a sense-based mating bond system. It's reminiscent of ABO slash Omegaverse minus the biological hierarchy and smut. The space elves mate for life, and when one goes, the other contracts to form a super broken heart syndrome called Widow Syndrome, and they slowly deteriorate. It's just a fact of life for them. When the deadbeat got smooshed, Bathion was like, well, looks like my mom's got like maybe a year left to live now. C'est la vie! Not gonna lie, I found a dark humor to it, and I had a good laugh at Vathion's rather cavalier approach to his mom's impending demise. I don't really know the logistics of the scent bonding process, but somehow, Hasabi and the deadbeat never fully bonded with one another. The deadbeat managed to keep her stable by sending her reminders of what he smelt like. Add in occasional space Skype calls, and that sums up the state of their relationship for over 16 years. The narrative stresses how this scent mate bond is severely ingrained into the space elf species. So on occasion, it'll be like, hey, how is Mutan physically able to be so far from his mate? And the answer we're always given is along the lines of, well, I guess he can just bypass his biology because he's that awesome, hum de dum. Ugh, I pray that there is a legit reason why the deadbeat had been capable of functioning that long without Hasabi. His autobiography mentions how he missed her and yearned for her. She even sent him articles of her clothing as well. But taking into account their relationship dynamic pre-bonding, I got the impression early on that she needed him more than he needed her. Especially since the distance has started to really wear her down before the deadbeat's death. This also affected Vathion too. Since Hasabi was like a ticking time bomb, he had to be mindful of his own scent. Considering he's their son, I guess his scent is similar to his dad's, therefore he's the delicate thread that holds his mom together, which is a fantastic pressure to put on a child, I might add. Vathion worried about any changes his scent might undergo while growing up. He also kept away from girls because he couldn't risk their scent tainting his and thereby possibly detonating that time bomb. Even though Vathion sacrificed for his mom, she had no qualms, no hesitation in shipping his ass off to war as an admiral for the Deadbeat's private fleet. Sure, Hasabi most likely just didn't want Vathion to watch her slowly wither away, a la the anime mom. She may also want to simply honor her late husband's wishes. So, she yeets her child into the space shark pit and then retires to space Acapulco? Okay. <laughs> Hasabi was also totally complicit in the Deadbeat's decisions in how to prepare Vathion to follow in his footsteps. It's a special kind of horrible. I want to read a passage that takes place right before Hasabi ditches Vathion's ass. And I don't want to just paraphrase it because I want to emphasize the tone of the scene. Hasabi's husband recently died and she's at a spaceport with Vathion, who she had to strong arm to accept the admiral position. They're waiting for the transport ship to arrive and, as far as they know, whisk him away for good. Vathion toyed with his muffin a moment before deciding to take a swallow of his tea. I don't know if I'll like it up there. Don't be silly, Hasabi insisted. Space is in your blood. I've seen how you look at the stars, Vathion. You'll love it out there. Shaking his head, Vathion looked towards her pleadingly. But I don't know how to pilot. I don't have the nano implants to do it. And I really don't know how to command a fleet. 
He blushed as he realized he had raised his voice shrilly just as some people were passing. They glanced towards him, then looked down again. Ducking his head down, he flushed. Laughing, Hasabi shook her head. You do too, she insisted. You remember that full physical you got when you were 12? Blinking at her, Vathion nodded cautiously. You mean... Mm-hmm. Your father had the doctor implant you then. And don't worry about piloting. You probably won't ever need to. But if you do, it's just like the first level of your space game boy. Hasabi reassured, petting his hair back from his eyes. Now drink your tea. You'll feel better. Though, that made him wonder what type of implants Natan had gotten for him. They were probably not the standards. Perhaps grade 3? They were the most widely available, if most expensive on the market. Now, grade 4s were something to drool over. With the right AI, you could have complete contact with it. Imperial pilots just got grade 1s, maybe 2s. Pursing his lips, he muttered, Maybe I don't want to feel better. Vathion did as he was told and chugged his steaming drink, then inhaled the muffin as the spaceport checkpoint continued to fill. And that's it. The conversation ends there, and the focus shifts elsewhere. But just look at this mother's lackadaisical attitude towards her child's discomfort, as well as said child with zero fucks to give upon finding out that he had an implant inserted into him without his knowledge or consent. Simply delicious. Now, I know I'm whinging about how Hasabi is just the best mom ever, but don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining that she's simply like this. I'm complaining that she's like this, yet as with other themes that become present here, the narrative doesn't go deeper with it. I don't even think the book believes Hasabi is necessarily flawed. And she's not the worst one, though. No, 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 no. The true Best Parent Award goes to the harbinger of my suffering, the bearer of all the blame. Part 5. The Deadbeat. This guy. Jeez, I'm sweating, because... Where do I begin with Space Elf Hohenheim? This guy is overwhelmingly awful. It'd be incredibly easy to just take a sledgehammer to the OMG wall and start screaming into it. Like, what is coherency when it comes to ragging on the despicable? Uh, okay, let's start with someplace easy, where the text may as well be booping the hell out of our collective snoot. His stupid f***ing autobiography. To be blunt, once again, the deadbeat's a shitty writer. He was about 54 when he wrote it, but his prose is that of a 13-year-old masturbating over his own greatness within his diary. How he's just so intelligent and clever that he f***s bitches and got paid. Which has got to be like, so awkward for his wife and son. His sole target audience, they're the only ones reading this! <laughs> like. The document itself was bequeathed to Vathion alongside the Deadbeat's will. The text implies that this is for Vathion and Hasabi's eyes only. It begins with, I'd like to start out by saying that this goes out to my beloved and my son. I'd like to thank them for putting up with my infrequent calls and never, ever, 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 ever visiting them. So, I suppose I should start at the beginning. First things first, I'm the realist, realist. Drop this and let the whole world feel it, let him feel it. And I'm still in the murder business, I can hold you down like I'm giving lessons in physics, right? You should want a bad bitch just like this, ha. Huh? Drop it low and pick it up just like this, yeah. <laughs> that is such a stupid bit. Why did I do that? Why did I? <laughs> I can't believe I did that. That was so dumb. <laughs> uh, okay. Whoopsie. Mistake. That was a mistake on many levels. <laughs> but I want you to remember that putting up with my infrequent calls and never visiting them bit. Forget the, forget the Iggy Azalea part, please wipe that from your mind. I regret doing that, but I had to make a point. <laughs> Just remember that he never ever called or visited them. I'm, I'm gonna return to that. Forget the other thing though. <laughs> the dead... <laughs> The deadbeat was just too smart for school, so he tormented the dean till he could graduate early. And then, like, he had an older brother in the Navy who just disappeared mysteriously one day. So he used that as an excuse to join the Navy himself. Except, never mind looking into his brother's disappearance, that was just pretense for him to do whatever the f he wanted for himself. He, like, maybe tried to look for his brother for, like, five minutes. 
And then when he got too vague of an answer, he was like, okay, I guess I'll never find out. Whatever. So anyway, let's get good. <laughs> I need to f bitches like now. <laughs> His battle tactics were so on point one time that the Emperor became his BFF and everyone was super jealous. No one clapped for him. Obama was not there. <laughs> oh well, past is the past. Gattis and I never got to be good friends of any sort. But when he mentioned he wanted to start a civilian fleet to me, the thought hit me. What the war needed? We're not just Imperial Navy officers for heroes, but some regular peeps. He then went on and yoinked Gattis' idea, as Gattis was too poor to do the thing, and the deadbeat wasn't. Ah, yes. The one percenters doing the thing. Again. Banks, I hate it. <laughs> he assembled his captains and crew of regular peeps who were his old Imperial Navy officer buddies. <laughs> what is with this guy and nepotism? I swear to God, it's hilarious. And he had his flagship made out so spiffy with 24 guns and a custom coated AI. He was just so good at killing rebel scum, his Emperor BFF made him an admiral. And then he signed his and the crew's, without the crew's permissions, he signed their rights away and their likeness away to a TV show producer, and then he became a star. Because I was now a star, and because I had more than one ship, I started making up funky battle plans and surprising the rebels with crazy things that shouldn't have worked, but they did because they were surprising. <laughs> I love this son of a bitch, I hate him. I hate him so much, but he's so f***ing funny because he's so f***ing stupid. <laughs> It's like reading, it's like reading Sherry's perspective again. <laughs> oh, I'm nostalgic for him, but for mortals. I want to go back to that shit. <laughs> oh my god, this f***ing moron. <laughs> and he's in his mid-50s and he talks like this, like... <laughs> I don't know if I'm one to talk though, but I'm not in my 50s. Not long after that, he entered his belligerent drunk phase. And Hasabi was offered to him as a sacrificial maiden, and we all know how that went. Like, seriously, this 54-year-old frat f was the face of this mighty galactic empire, and he was such a pompous dickhead. A dickhead who knew he was smart and handsome and chased after his ambitions and the pussy. And the narrative fully admits this. I think he's supposed to be a deconstruction of the hero, where instead of the stereotypical hero archetype, we get a flawed space elf human. And it's good in concept, but fails in execution. Natan is just so insufferably obnoxious. As much as he makes me laugh, I am crying and dying on the inside. Please believe that. And I know the intelligent wisecrack type is popular. I love them too, even though I'm starting to find them a little more obnoxious as I age. Yet he's another character who turns it up to that spicy 1100, where this cheekiness isn't endearing, and I just want this middle-aged man to sound like a grown up. Albeit, when we first met him in the space Skype call, he was toned down, and you know, I. I he seemed like an actual person. But unfortunately, the autobiography, which he wrote shortly before his death, is still the main insight I have into his character. It's all I can work with. But it doesn't even end there. Recall his opening words about Vathion and Hasabi, putting up with his infrequent calls and never visiting them, and how he left Hasabi completely once she got pregnant. I think it's noteworthy, in a scumbag way, how the deadbeat chose to handle his new family, Yes, he kept them at a distance for their physical safety. But he also never considered the option of retiring and settling down with Hasabi and soon to be Vathion, because he definitely had the money for it. Sure, he lamented on the what if and the what could have been, but the thought of truly hanging it up and walking away never ever crossed his mind. And it's even kind of more pathetic because even his family members were like, yeah, he wanted to be away from us. and. That's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's okay. It's fine. Even if he was this big name heroic celebrity star, it's not like he couldn't stop. One of the fake stories that Vathion fed to the media and most of his crew was that Natan did run off into the night with Hasabi, 
and despite Vathion's presence serving as an adequate enough distraction to the masses, nobody cared enough to send a search party out anyway, as far as we know. The people had no issue switching Natan 1.0 out for the newer model. So long as someone's there to pose and smile for them, that's enough. To reiterate, the narrative acknowledges that Vathion and thereby Natan are mascots for the Empire. Usually, when entertainment figures leave the public eye, the people will forget and move on over time. And if this empire crumbles over the loss of one singular asshole, well, frankly, that really says a lot over how feeble this supposed superpower really is. I'm not even factoring in the lizard familiars that are prevalent with this space elf species. That's a whole nother can of worms, and book one only teases the possible true nature, so I don't even have enough information to work with there. That aside, something Vathion says to one of the other admirals stuck with me. My father found a way to avoid bonding with mom. That was the last thing he wanted to do to himself. Her, or me for that matter. A battleship is no place for a planet dweller and infant, and he just wouldn't have been happy on the ground while there was so much to do. And in my notes, I wrote, If he grounded himself and fully bonded with Hasabi, he'd still feel just as antsy, right? And that'd be such an interesting conflict, fighting his biology with his own desires, his mighty need to be up in space versus his familial duty. I sense this would have been a pretty dysfunctional family, and it would have been fascinating to read. As it stands now, one could interpret that his lack of a decision as mere cowardice. He opted to not take a leap of faith and effort to have his cake and eat it too. I guess this choice can work, but as with the darker side of Vathion's upbringing, this overall theme is just not explored. Yeah, so... Another opportunity just flies on by. That's cool. Also, the Deadbeat's contact with Vathion is so infrequent that he only had maybe four meaningful conversations with the Deadbeat in the last year. They were over the vid and all started with, so tell me why your grades have dropped. I think in total, they add up to 10 minutes and that's counting the awkward pauses. Needless to say, the Deadbeat and Vathion have a very complicated relationship. Natan wasn't apparent so much as the bad cop the moment his son's grades slipped from perfect. And when Vathion was old enough, he planned to have Vathion and Hasabi join me. And so I did all I could to get him into classes that would teach him skills he ne needed to be my second in command. And that's what he did. He got the best tutors he could find. He made Vathion study almost a dozen languages to proficiency, had a piloting ship implanted into him without his knowledge, and more. Natan groomed his child to succeed him, all without even considering what Vathion wanted. Added bonus, the deadbeat even planned to use his wife and child as bait to lure his Acme-sponsored assassin out, which is a real kick in the nuts when Vathion was just crying over him not some pages ago. And it's evident that Vathion sought some form of approval or affection from his dad. He still loves him. For some reason, I think he just craved the validation. His favorite memory is receiving video and specs of a fleet ship named after him for his birthday, which is something I find really f***ing sad. Vathion's favorite memory of his departed father is nothing emotional. No sentimental moment between father and son. No, daddy just emails the kids some f***ing reference materials and calls it a day. Yet. Vathion flashed his father's grin at the other captains. What about you? From there, they traded favorite memories with much laughter, which Vathion was sure Natan would have wanted. They just carry on laughing. This is something I find so infuriating with how the book presents Natan's character. Something with f***ed up subtext like this will drop and it gets brushed aside, gone completely unnoticed. Sure, the book will recognize that Natan's an actual dickhead on one page, but then it'll spend many more lionizing the shit out of him, as if it's saying, yeah, he could be an occasional asshole, but he's still a good person. And like, no he ain't. And that should be okay. If he's meant to be a deconstruction of the hero archetype, then lean into the nuance here. Don't be afraid of dirtying a main character at the expense of his likability. If anything, this flip-flopping makes him unpleasantly unenjoyably unbearable. Own that he is awful. Then spend the remaining books winning me back over because I know the dead beast not completely gone. How do I know this? Well, for one, the book likes to stress that the memory lives on. And two? Part 5.5. 5. 
there's just something about that gosh darn med bay. So, the intriguing thing that's marinating in the med bay, it's a clone of the deadbeat. Yep, a vessel with the same appearance as the Empire's Messiah is just vibing in a tank off in the corner, collecting cobwebs and dust for all we know. We learn that creating clones is illegal for some reason, but nobody seems to care. Bathion even narks to the Emperor about it, and he's just like, meh. But Chekhov's clone is continuously brought up just so we don't forget about its existence. It's obvious that it will have a part to play in book two or three, but as it stands now, it has no purpose, which, I mean, just because this plot device is queued up for future use doesn't mean that purpose has to be its only reason to exist. If this clone is going to be mentioned now, then do something else with it in the meantime. Like, we have a main protagonist with unresolved feelings in need of closure with his departed father, a man who was never physically or emotionally present in his life. And here we have a bona fide doll with the same face as said dad within walking distance, and Vathion's like, nah, that's okay, I'd rather take my pent-up emotions out on dad's emotionally vacant lizard familiar, because that will absolutely lead to some kind of catharsis. Granted, he does briefly talk to Natan's urn, but confiding in a jar of chocolate milk mix doesn't quite pack the same punch as confronting an actual face, and for a kid who is prone to vent and cry his feelings out, it seems like yet another missed opportunity to have him totally break down in front of a mere simulacrum because that's the best he'll ever get now! Jesus! What we could have had! Ugh! <sighs> Hell, speaking of Vathion's missed opportunities, now's the perfect time to segue into... Part 6, The Tragedy of Vathion. So, who is Vathion? Well, he's a 5'7 short king who is somehow the tallest character in this mighty empire of itty bitties. Oh, and he's also the consolation prize between an enthralled, codependent young woman and a man-child driven by his ego and ambition. He's been groomed by said Papa Man-child to follow in Daddy's footsteps, whether Vathion wants to or not. The deadbeat spared no expense. He ensured his kid was gonna know their shit. It had to be this way. How else was the book gonna convince us that this 16-year-old fetus was qualified to command an entire private military space fleet? Hopes in a can-do attitude? Nay, we gotta over-justify this shit, and man does it ever backfire. Every problem Vathion faced is met with, gee, it sure is convenient that I'm already equipped with the exact solution needed. Woo! Galaxy filled with many different species to communicate with? Good thing Vathion's been taught 11 different languages to proficiency, including a multi-language that's a mishmash of a bunch of other languages. And hey, even got the chance to cultivate his linguistic skills at a spaceport cafe for a few years where he was able to already start networking. Before that, he was fortunately looked after by an alien wolf mama, or the wolf bitch as Vathion disrespectfully would say. She also happens to have her own pull with that alien wolfman captain that Vathion t posed dominance over. Ugh, what are the odds? Gotta decrypt some hacker's complicated code matrices or navigate the ship's systems on the download? Man, it's fortunate that Vathion's been tutored by the Empire's top hacker criminal. And hey, the kid got so good, he's even made a name for himself in the hacker circle. Even professional nerds are fans of his work. I'm not even near done yet, folks. Okay, need to be knowledgeable about general ship design efficiency and just have a feel about the sh status of ships? Remember, Papa Deadbeat was adamant about that one. Again, even the pros are impressed with the kids' acumen. What about some uh, space battle tactics know-how? Luckily, all those years dedicated to achievement hunting on that OP special Game Boy got him there! And hey! General space fleet management might call for some financial abilities, right? Or, you know, maybe even need a hefty money purse already on hand? Oh, good thing Vathion had a financial portfolio since he was eight! And he had to show at least a 10% profits every mother quarter, lest he get grounded. Since he was eight! Eight! Jesus! It's like, hey mom, can I go outside and play rocket ship? Oh, I'm sorry, dear. Your investment in space Tesla took a 2% dive last quarter, so your father said no playtime for a month. Now go upstairs and conjugate some verbs in 10 languages. I'll let you know when dinner's ready. <laughs> so f***ing stupid. <laughs> Do you need a keen eye for 
sorting through security footage and impress the older subordinates. Well, thank God for acing a video editing school project that one time. Gotta have piloting skills just in case some inexplicable event calls for it. Bless the secret implant daddy ordered. Oh! Oh! What about if there's this really specific event where a mischievous alien species that's known to scale walls and shit sends out a dinner invite, but there's a high possibility that they'll turn off the gravity in their ship as a simultaneous prank and test. Well, thank f***ing Christ, Bathion just so happened to have the wherewithal to pack some convenient ass moon gloves and moon shoes for such an occasion. Bathion is so ridiculously overprepared that he hardly ever makes any mistakes in this book. In fact, I counted that he made only two errors that were unequivocally his fault. The first was his initial approach to Admiral Stern's Silver Fox. In the heat of the moment, he forgot Silver Fox's video game traits and how to approach him based on the information from the game. It was nothing more than a little oopsie daisy that set his social link back a couple points and it was easily rectified later. The second was his ride or die tactic during the climactic battle that led to casualties. It could have been worse, but the reality of those deaths hit him for like five minutes and then he moved on. He also attributes his ride or die decision to him being exhausted due to stress, sleep deprivation, and not eating properly, which yes, the story made a point to mention how little Vathion ate at any given opportunity. But then Vathion's like, well, it's not like anyone actually cares about my well-being. When there have been instances where, like, some characters, Kitty in particular, were like, Hey, you should see the doctor if you're not feeling well. And Vathion just brushed it off like, Oh no, I'll just get some sleeping pills and pills make my tummy ache. Meh. Plus, that shit's not in their pay grade, kid. Especially since he previously T-posed his big dick dominance over them. So, like, nice try pinning the blame elsewhere, asshole. <laughs> it makes it difficult to really root for this main character when the path before him is a literal rose petaled red carpet. It's even more difficult when the main protagonist simply struts down that carpet without slipping on any of the petals. Bathion never flubbed up when speaking in all those languages. He knew just the right thing to say to people to charm them or shut them up. He never had much struggle or challenge improving his qualification and worth to everyone. Adults folded to his big boy galaxy brain time and time again. Aside from that one time with Stern Silver Fox, he did not fail any charisma, intimidation, persuasion, bluff, spot, or perception checks. Just kept on rolling them 20s. Even minor things, like did he have to be the one to notice a security cam tampering because he did really well on some similar video editing school project once upon a time ago? Did Vathion have to be the one who outhacked the professional nerd and marvel everyone around him with his decoding prowess? Or did he need to somehow find the time in between all that not eating, not sleeping, 4D hacking, autobiography reading, and having alien diplomacy space Skype calls to design spaceship blueprints well enough to impress the head engineer? What's the purpose of having supposedly competent adults in the room if they're just reduced to complimentary yes-men? <sighs> However, the one significant exception to Vathion's seemingly perfect luck is the climactic space battle. I enjoyed that climax because the smooth sailing finally stopped. With all the buildup, how amazeballs this child has been in conquering the harsh adult world, I was really looking forward to having this kid getting captured. Vathion overplayed his hand and was pushed to a corner with his first L ready to body his ass straight into the space gulag. And after 240 pages of constant dick stroking, I have never cheered for a protagonist's complete and utter defeat this hard before. I was stoked. I needed that catharsis. But alas, I was deprived of such a release and my literary boner deflated out as a sad little fart. I don't utterly detest his character though. I appreciate how active and rounded he is. Thought went into his character. Like another thing I intentionally left out is Vathion's fake charisma, his acting. It's his one trait that's consistent. He has to put on this mask in front of others, in front of everyone. Hell, that fakeness is depicted in a very literal sense with a play. The title itself plays off this theme. The story starts with Vathion on a literal stage that eventually transitions into a figurative one. It's, it's on the nose, but it works. To the book's credit, the mask isn't a secure fit. He can maintain the facade in front of others for only a short while. He really doesn't have that much emotional endurance, which makes sense because he's still very much a child. 
And when he's with people he trusts, the mask slides askew. He resets into his default resting kicked pet face mode. This is Vathion's personal brand that the book likes to remind us about more than it needs to. And then when he's alone, the mask slips all together and usually we get a scene of him feeling insecure and vulnerable, which is good. I'm totally here for boys expressing emotions and crying, especially given the circumstances. But like I said, he gets over these feelings too fast to let the emotional beat set in. He doesn't move on in a concealed don't feel sense, but an okay, next topic one. And I feel like that contradicts the whole point of him having these moments of private vulnerability in the first place. That mask Vathion wears isn't just his characteristic facade though. Specifically, it's the role of his father that he's assumed since page one. And a portion of this character's tragedy, you know, aside from all the grooming, is that time and again, he will adamantly reject the notion that he is like his father, and time and again, the book will prove otherwise. From Vathion assuming his inherited position to his general behavior and treatment toward his crew, how he plots his battle strategies, him continuing the TV serial when he really didn't have to, and how he handles his fans. Speaking of which, part 6.5, the spectacularly gross role. So Vathion refers to his posturing before the masses as acting spectacular. It's a role he's pulled straight from his dad's playbook, apart from all the exaggerated posing and grandstand hyping. He'll also kiss and grope fangirls, who in turn kia kia and eat it all up. It's so awkward, cause like why have this even back in 2007? I, I guess it's to compare Vathion and Natan's celebrity status to that of rock stars. That's peak desirability after all, who doesn't want to f**k a rock star? But the way both of them flagrantly toy with women in public, in front of a crowd no less, big or small, no one bats an eye at it. It calls to mind a quote from like some old guy. Mm, okay, how did it go again? Okay, um, I was like, something, something, a star, something, something, do it, do, do anything. Um, uh, nah. okay, it's probably not that important. And it'd be one thing if the people's blind complacency were a dark commentary on how they just are, like with how they are so accepting with widow syndrome being a fact of life for them. But it's not. Nothing is done with this. This mentality just exists to prop up both of these characters' popularity within their sphere. It's so dated and gross. Vathion also has a penchant for noting and commenting on the tits and general appearance of every single woman. And that's not a hyperbole. He does this again and again and again and again. Just way too much. Like, I get that he denied himself basic boyish horny on main behavior for his fragile mother's sake. He's using this newfound freedom from his mom to let his eyes finally wander and commentate on the female form. Fine. But I get the point after the first few times. Neither Vathion nor the deadbeat drink that respects women juice. You can stop tossing all these tits in my face now. It's obnoxious and suffocating. Something I never thought I'd say about tits. That's what this book is doing to me. It's making me anti-tits. I don't support that. <laughs> I swear, if the deadbeat didn't have such a vice grip on Vathion's future, he would have gone on to create Space Facebook. So... While I don't necessarily hate Vathion's character, one can hopefully understand why I found it difficult to root for him. My favorite moment, nay, my favorite scene in the whole book though, is where Vathion robs a merchant family for absolutely no reason. It is the creme de la creme of peak Vathionist. It's just, ah, mwah, such art, such lulls. Please allow me to paint you the tapestry. After one of Vathion's one-sided space curb stompings, he finds a stranded civilian spaceship vibin' amidst the wreckage and hulls them in. In said ship is a small merchant family that was simply at the wrong place at the wrong time and suffered for it. They have a plot device that they happily fork over. The daughter is, of course, horny on main for your boy, with her parents just right there, not giving it a second thought. A few scenes later, one that includes another round of Vathion acting spectacular for all the squealing fangirls in their low-cut tops, we revisit the family. Okay, so I checked out the state of your ship and to be honest, it's been totaled, but fret not. 
Out of the goodness of my heart, I will flip the bill for not only the repairs, but also some slick ass upgrades. In exchange, I want a cut of the profits you make. The mother and daughter both smooch Fathion hard, and the father looks like he's about to faint in relief. As if I want a cut of the profits you make flew in one ear and out the other. They danced, hugged, and rejoiced, not processing this is not an act of charity, because that's not something heroes do. It's all about that quid pro quo, baby. Fathion cuts in again. And should I ever need to know something, you'll of course supply me with what you know. Of course, yes, the father gasped. What percentage did you want? Shrugging a bit, Vathion pondered. 30 sound all right? <sighs> okay. Now, this book may tell us that Vathion's a super special genius big boy nerdo, but I don't know if he knows how numbers and percentages work. Because um, that seems like a lot. <laughs> And we don't even know if that's 30% of the net sum or per each product sold. Either way, Vathion, the Empire's hero is making out like a bandit here. They stared at him. You don't want 50 or 60? The mother asked breathlessly. Oh my god! Why are they expecting him to ask for more? What space loan sharks have they been dealing with? Hell, this almost comes off as them offering Vathy on that 50 or 60%. You'd think they'd throw in their daughter while they're at it. Please, Daddy, rob me some more. Oh, you make my family's financial collapse feel so good. Again, Vathion shrugged. What would I need that for? I've got other income sources, so I've got no reason to gouge you. I prefer getting paid in information more than cash. Then why are you taking 30% of their profits anyway? And in what world is that not already gouging them? <laughs> like, okay, space elf Eric Prince, I guess running a private military force doesn't fund itself. All about that bottom line, mother I, I think this moment is meant to be yet another savvy deal maker tally that's to be etched into the overcompetency bedpost. But like, why are you doing this, bro? <laughs> What's the point in robbing these innocent people? We find out about the whole financial portfolio nonsense 10 pages later, so it's not like he really needed their money like he said, but so like, what's the incentive? Is it for Vathion's hubris? I mean, his whole crossing the threshold moment was fueled purely by stubborn pride when Gatas presented him with an out and he dug his feet in the sand instead. Hell, his entire motivation for doing any of this is not only his own pride, but also the pride he holds in the father he has sought validation and affection from. At the very beginning, Vathion made his one and only desire quite clear. He was not all that excited about filling in his deadbeat's colossal shoes. And not only did mommy suplex that doubt, she also snuffed out the chance for Vathion to become his own individual. From then, he trudged on under the misconception that he had to. There was absolutely no choice for him, despite the outs presented to him. He only doubled down and tried to secure the mask on tighter. And when you wear the mask long enough, it eventually becomes your true face. Too bad it seems more like a case of dissonance than an intentional character study on the deteriorating state of this child's sense of self-identity. See, even though Vathion is a rounded character, he is unfortunately a static protagonist he does not learn nor change from the wait okay who or what even is the actual book one antagonist supposed to be and why has it taken me to like now to question it i i feel like the book wants it to be gatus as he is the only outwardly antagonistic force that vathion faces but he has been nothing more than a hacky sack for vathion to kick about if anything, I think it's Fathion's own sense of pride. He wouldn't be where he is without it. Either option falls flat though, as he just trudged on the same as before. Like, I know this is only the first installment, but I genuinely cannot tell if this book knows of all the shit that lies beneath its own surface. Or if it does, but just doesn't care. This confusion flies in full force during the scene post-climatic battle, where Mirith slides all up stage left to once again her assume her one and only role. <sighs> Mirith smiled down at him, tears still in her eyes. You're really strong, you know that, right? What do you mean? 
Mirith traced his brows with her finger and then tucked his hair behind an ear. Exactly like I said, she said. Life hasn't been fair to you at all, but here you are, convincing the universe that you're perfectly fine, that how you were raised didn't do you any damage at all. Hindsight is always perfect. Dropping his gaze, Fathion sighed softly. I just do what needs doing. See, it's statements like that and the fact that you actually do what you say. She smiled again and ruffled his hair. Do you have a kitchen here? At first, I thought this was said completely straight. That Vathion turned out completely fine from his upbringing and I was like, um, excuse me? You are wrong? But as I stared at it longer, my take shifts to Mirith acknowledging that Vathion had indeed been dealt an unfair hand, yet he still overcame it. But even then, all she knows is that Vathion had a dad all along that he couldn't be with. Then on the day that he could, that opportunity was swept away. She doesn't know the true extent of the damage done. And then the way she suddenly shifts to where the kitchen at is so jarring it makes her previous words and tears seem insincere. I even consulted a couple of my friends about it and they each had different takes on the matter, so who f***ing knows? Ugh, okay. Let's bring it on home. Part 7. In Conclusion. As you, the viewers, can all probably tell by now, there's a lot more within the subtext of the narrative than the actual text part. The book is a tour bus that doesn't stop at the points of interest. Like, excuse me, excuse me, can, can we stop for a few minutes at the House of Family Dysfunction, please? No? Um, okay, like, what about the House of Declining Self-Identity? Uh, no to that too, huh? Okay, well, well, okay, surely, surely we can at least, like, slow down a bit and take pictures of the monument depicting the commodification of war as primetime dramatic entertainment for the masses? No? Oh, come on! Like, I know, again, this is only book one out of three. Maybe the later books will stop to explore the layers hidden beneath itself, because already there are interesting things here to look at that the tour bus just drives right on past, because... Those things aren't deemed relevant. The rebel scum plot, the murder conspiracy, jacking off Vathion to the Empire till his dick combusts from the friction. That's what's important to the book. We're on a 2D linear path here. No three-dimensional detours allowed. And I think that's a damn shame. The implications that can be drawn from the subtext is a hell of a lot deeper than the simplicity of getting popular with the masses and pew-pewing the supposed bad guys, who may or may not even be bad guys at all if I comprehended the last chapter correctly. There's definitely gold buried deep beneath this poorly constructed, inconclusive first draft. I'll just have to live with the fact that I'll never touch that treasure. C'est la vie. Even plot-wise, I'll never find out how much of a girl boss this rebel faction leader may be. I can headcanon her victory and supremacy over the Empire, though considering the Empire is filled with these absolute brainlets who depend on their possibly pro-eugenics brain slug lizard familiars to compensate for their own faults, who's to say which side is right? The rebels. The rebels are right. Down with the Empire. I shan't change my mind. Fight the good fight, girl boss. Once again, I'd like to thank K.E. Ireland for commissioning this golden goose level of material, as well as her immense patience and for being an overall good sport. Go read her Natan Fleet series yourself if you're curious how far a vigorous literary edging session can go. Give her your money and then email me and tell me how this series ends. Please, I'm begging you. Because I don't have the strength to do it myself anymore. Because, like, here is where I will tap out. It's been an engaging if not immeasurably exhausting ride. A ride that has now made me nostalgic for trashy vintage anime for some reason, which I will now go watch and be thankful for how far we've come. Which isn't really that far, but I'll take what I can get. And come on, let's be real. We're lucky Vathion never face-planted into a pair of buoyant Z-cups, right? Huh? Huh? Uh, well, though, um, even then, it's not like anyone would care, because... When you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Why, hello there. So nice of you to drop by. If you'll please become utterly entranced by this crudely drawn hip swiveling, I'd like to deliver my ending spiel. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you all for watching. If you like what you see, and how can you not look at these hips go? 
please consider supporting me on my Patreon, where you can get one day early access to all upcoming videos, as well as the entire uncut audio of book reviews. You can hear me yap for almost double the amount of time! You can also vote for the next novel for me to suffer through, or enjoy. I'm at y'all's mercy after all. I can even draw sketches for you at child labor prices. Oh! I just, I just. Kinda. If you're unable to support me on a subscription basis via Patreon, and I totally understand, I also have a Kofi page tip jar for your instant generosity needs. You do you, boo. No judgment. Finally, a like and subscribe still goes a long way. I'm eternally grateful for any and all support. You may now peel your eyes away from this sexy, sexy penguin body. Remember to stay hydrated, friends, and take care.